He, he's going to be our one thing, not just a thing. We're not going to do church and show up and go, oh yeah, and Jesus thanks that we're still breathing today. But we're going to show up and we're going to go, Jesus, the only reason we have breath is because of you. And all we're going to do is honor you with everything that we have when we come into this place. Because he deserves it. He's not a thing. He is the one thing. He's all that we need, and he's called us to love him like we believe he's all that we need. He's called us to love him with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength. That's the first thing we're supposed to get down. That's it. He, Jesus says, this is my first and great commandment. Do this. Love me. Love me. Put me first. Value me. Don't make me something you're adding to your life. Make me the very thing that your life begins to revolve around. Him. Amen. Yeah. Oh, we've been talking about just pressing into the presence of the Lord and how now is the time for us to seek God. Can we put up Hosea 10.12? I don't know where I'm going right now, but I know I want to read Hosea 10.12. It's in there somewhere. Yeah. We prayed into this verse on Wednesday night. It was so good. It left for a minute, but now it's back. Sow for yourself righteousness. Reap steadfast love. See, I believe that revival, there's some people that teach and believe that revival is just this miraculous thing and that people don't have anything to do with it. I call bull on that. I believe that people do have something to do with it. I believe that people have to sow for themselves righteousness. And that means if we haven't been living a righteous life according to God's standards, then it's time for us to repent, turn away, and go, I know. We know. I'm looking around. I think we know what God's righteous standard is. We know what it is. And if we haven't been living according to that standard, if we haven't been living according to holiness, then the Lord's saying it's time to start sowing righteousness. We want to know why we're not reaping the steadfast love of God. Well, have we been sowing the righteousness he's called us to sow? And guess what? He hasn't left us um, in our own weakness to try to lead a righteous life. Glory to God, somebody. We have a comforter. We have the Holy Spirit. And his name is holy for a reason. Because he leads us into holiness. Because when we yield ourselves and surrender to him, he actually empowers us to walk out a holy life. When we yield ourselves to him, we're able to walk in the light just as Jesus walked in the light. Isn't that something? I guess really something. And, and we can cry and beg God for revival all we want, but if we're not willing to sow righteousness, I believe that those prayers are just hitting the ceiling. The Lord wants us to start going, hey, I know there's things in my life that aren't right. It's time for me to get those things right. It's time for me to return to the Lord with my whole heart because he's called me to walk in righteousness. It's still in your Bible. Be holy as I am holy. Still in there. And let me tell you, I'm, I'm preaching to me right now. Y'all looking at me like, James, you're coming at me hard. I'm coming at me hard because this is the call to me. This is the call to my heart. He says, be holy as I am holy. Guess what? I don't think our heavenly father gives us a command that he goes, eh, I'm going to give you something that's so hard. I know it'll be impossible for you to do. I want to set you up to fail. You think your father's doing that? Do you think a good God in heaven would say, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give these people a command that I know they'll never be able to obey. Be holy as I am holy. But most of us have looked at that and went, well, there's no way I can be holy like God's holy. So we kind of just write that away in the Bible. But guess what? He wants us to be holy as he is holy. And he's given us the power to be holy as he is holy. And we're, we're asking God to do something. We're wanting God. We're begging God. I'm begging God to do something in my life because we need it. Like we've, we've messed around. And, and here's the deal. Number one, I'm, I'm the oldest millennial is 38. So I'm kind of at the top end of millennials. Do you know you had a millennial pastor? That's crazy. Man, you didn't sign up for that, did you? <laughs> um, but the oldest millennials, everybody just figured, like, in past generations, what had happened was, okay, 
everybody knew that, you know, when you went to college and in your early 20s, you know, you kind of strayed from the church. But then once you had kids, you would kind of come back and get into church. Guess what? Millennials didn't do that. Not by and large. They didn't. They left the church and they didn't come back. Why? Sometimes we need to ask ourselves hard questions like, why didn't they come back? I would propose to you it's because we didn't have anything real to offer them. Because we had settled for our religious routines and motions and we decided we're okay with playing church while we watched our sons and daughters leave and just thought, well, they'll come back someday. Instead of actually being broken over it and saying, what are we going to do to make sure our sons and daughters never walk away in the first place? And here's the deal. That's happened with millennials and now Generation Z, who is everybody 18 and under, this has just got my heart captured. I talked about it last night when I was talking to teenagers. Generation Z, everybody 18 and under, guess what? Because we've decided to just kind of ride the fence and play church and not really go after Jesus because we've allowed Jesus to be a thing and not one thing because Jesus hasn't been real. Generation Z is now projected to be the very first in American history, the very first generation that is post-Christian in American history. We've lost them. They're gone. God isn't even part of what they think about. What are we going to do about it? That's why I'm saying we've got to have revival. And it's got, revival starts in the house of God. When the church is revi revived and, and brought back to the standing that she's called to be in, then guess what? Awakening can start taking place in the world. When we turn to the Lord and we start saying, I'm going to sow righteousness. Where'd my passage go? I need it back. Hosea 10 verse 12, it's in there. So right, then guess what? We will reap the steadfast love of the Lord. Break up your fallow ground, for it is the time to seek the Lord. If what I just said doesn't cause something in your heart, if you're saved and you love God and you care, like you actually give a rip about a whole generation not going to hell, because that's what's going to happen. Like if you care, then guess what? Now's the time. <laughs> It's yesterday was the time. <laughs> now, now's the time to seek the Lord that he may come and rain righteousness upon you. I want the Lord to come and rain righteousness upon a generation. Like I look at every young person in this room, 18 and under, <sighs> I want the Lord to rain righteousness on them. I want them to know God for real. I want them to have an encounter with God that causes them to doubt every doubt they've ever had about God. That's what I want. And you know what will set them up to do that? Is that they have a church family that's going after God for real. That every time they walk in this room, they don't see people playing around and going through the motions, but they actually see people that have found life and healing and wholeness in Jesus. They have found righteousness for themselves, and they're going, whatever mom and dad have, I want that. Whatever, whatever those people over there have, I want that. They long and they yearn for what's real. And I'm telling you, Jesus is real and the life that he can bring is real and the wholeness that he can bring is real. And there's something that can come over your life that you can start living like, I never knew that my life could be as good as it is right now because I'm walking so close to Jesus. That doesn't mean everything is good around your life, but it means inside of you. Inside of you. <laughs> inside of you, the chaos around you can't touch it because he's so real to you. Come on, we remember Jesus asleep on the boat? All 12 of his disciples? Where do, the, where do they find Jesus? Sleeping in the middle of the storm. Why is it? Why is it that Jesus could sleep in the middle of the storm? Because he had a peace inside of him that was greater than the chaos going on all around him. 
And too many of us have settled to go, well, that was Jesus. That could never, that could never be true for me. Yes, it can be true for you because he lives inside of you. Quit selling, quit selling Christianity and following Jesus short. If he said, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly, then I believe I'm just going to take him at his word and say, okay, Lord, if you have that kind of peace in the middle of a storm, I can have that kind of peace no matter what I go through. And when, when this generation sees people that are whole and love Jesus, and yes, life may get hard and life may be crazy and there may be chaos going, chaos going around us, but when we can stand firm in Jesus and we can go, mm, he's still the one thing that I need. May have lost my job. I didn't lose Jesus. <sighs> my marriage may be falling apart, but I haven't lost Jesus yet. Come on. There's something that can rise up inside of me that I have the one thing that I need. If we will sow, if we will break up that fallow ground and realize it is the time to seek the Lord, that he may come and rain righteousness upon us. That's what we need. We need the rain of righteousness to come on a generation. And it's, it's going to take, listen, I understand I understand we would, we would look around the, a room this morning and we would think, you know, maybe, and this is like not even a knock on Life Church. I'm glad Life Church is in Shawnee, America. I think thousands of people are being saved and I ain't, I ain't, even, I ain't even griping about that. Praise the Lord, okay? But some people might look and go, well, for like a movement this big that needs to happen, isn't it going to be like the mega church? No, it, it, it's going to be thousands of little churches just like this. Because there's way more of us than there are mega churches. Mega churches are like 1% of all churches. In fact, most people prefer to be part of a congregation that's, that's 100 people or less because you get to know people and build real relationships. So I don't look at the fact that we don't have thousands as a weakness. I look at it actually as one of our greatest weapons to be able to connect with people, to actually be able to know these young people that are part of Generation Z and say, not on our watch are we going to let you and, and your generation be lost. Like, we're going to contend for you. We're going to stand with you. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll do what it takes to see revival hit in our day so that we don't see a generation lost. It's going to take thousands of little churches like this. Jesus, Jesus didn't go, I need a mega church to change the world. He invested his life in 12 men. And then he had 120 in an upper room. That's it. Little church. In fact, that's about what we average, about 120. Oh, I love it. Oh, I love it. I love the fact that if we'll position ourselves, maybe one of these Sundays we'll walk in this room and a mighty rushing wind will hit this sanctuary and we'll have, <laughs> we'll have cloven tongues of fire start dancing over people's head and we'll be empowered to do something about what's happening here and now. He don't need the thousands. He just needs a few. Hungry, sold out, ready to go for him, no matter what it costs. I want to be one of the ones. Because I, I, I just have enough faith to believe that he can do it again. I do. I have enough faith in my heart to believe God can do it again. If he's done it before, he can do it again. I told the story of the Welsh Revival, and I've talked a little bit about the Welsh Revival on and off, but I just want to remind you of the Welsh Revival again because it's in my heart from speaking about it last night. Um, the Welsh Revival was one of the, a significant move of God that impacted America, um, and it impacted kind of the Pentecostal movement, kind of, we, we kind of have some roots in what was happening in Wales, but the Welsh Revival took place in 1904 and lasted till about 1906. And during that time, in Wells, um, God just sent a mighty move of God. He used a guy that was 26 years old named Evan, Evan Roberts. At 13 years old, he started praying every day that God would send revival to his nation. Every day, he began begging God. About 90 days before the revival hit, the Lord started waking him up at one in the morning, and he would pray from one till five. Then he would fall asleep around nine, get back up at noon, and then pray for another three or four hours before he went to work in the, in the mines, just praying, begging God to send an outpouring. This, this 
just been praying 13 years. Well, in his church, uh, one night they gathered together a youth prayer meeting. And as the prayer meeting's going, it, it was just kind of, just kind of run of the mill. You know, it was nothing, nothing big was happening in the meeting. But all of a sudden, a 13 year old girl, which I love how the Lord kind of worked that together. Evan Roberts started praying for revival at 13. And then a 13 year old girl stands up in, in the, in the prayer meeting to testify. And all she says is, here's all I know. I love Jesus with every shred of my being. I love him. And it said that something hit that meeting when she spoke those words. Like the fear of the Lord and the presence of God overwhelmed the the handful of young people that were there. And they look at that and that's what sparked the revival, that moment right there. And, and so they just started from that point on, they just started calling prayer meetings every night and nobody was in control of the meetings. It was completely spontaneous. It was just like Holy Spirit showed up, but he showed up in the response of there was a man and there was a group of people that sowed righteousness so that they could reap steadfast love. They had sought God. See, we want to figure out a new way to bring revival. There's only one way to bring revival. It's called God's people seeking his face. It's the only way it comes. It doesn't come from having better church services. It won't come if I get to be a better preacher, which I know some of you are praying that that'll happen. It's not going to come because of that. It's not going to come because the music gets better. It's not going to come because we have a nicer building. It will come only when God's people decide we're going to seek him. And there was a group of young people that started seeking God's face. And every night they would start around six when people got done at the mines and they would come in and they would just sit and they would wait on the Lord. And one of the things that Evan Roberts would do, he was considered the leader of the revival, but most nights all he did was sit in the front and he would, he would get his head down as far as he could usually. And the only thing that people heard him say, Lord, bend us, Lord, Break us. That's it. That's all they heard. And as he would pray, people would spontaneously spontaneously get up and lead a song that everybody knew. They just sang real simple songs. So they would, somebody would get up and start singing. And they would just break into worship spontaneously. And then somebody would just share about what God was doing in their life. And then somebody would cry out, I need to get saved right now. And they'd lead the person to the Lord. The Holy Spirit just started moving. But it wasn't... It wasn't that people hadn't done anything. People had done something. They had sought the Lord. And he showed up in power. And within the first two months in Wells, 70,000 people were born again. And it wasn't, it wasn't born again like sign a commitment card. It was radical salvations. Police officers got bored on their patrols because there was no crime in the streets. And, and Wells was a rough community because it was a mining town. So pl- the police usually stayed real busy. <laughs> it's amazing. Bars closed. <laughs> like, people weren't drinking anymore. They'd found the new wine. <laughs> they, they didn't need the stuff that they used to rely on. 70,000 people saved. My favorite story, my favorite story is how they had to retrain the mules that worked in the mining uh, in, the, in the mines. Because, dude, can you imagine? Okay, coal miner. This ain't the kind of dude that uses the language we're using in this room right now. Okay? Like, rough. These are some rough old boys. And so the way they had trained the mules was they had trained them with curse words. And so when the Lord saved them, the Lord cleaned up their mouth. They stopped using the language they used to use. And it said it took them three months to retrain the mules on how to do the commands they were giving without curses coming out of the mouth, without them cussing at them. Like, this wasn't just they checked something off the checklist. Like, the Holy Spirit really got a hold of people's hearts. And it started with just a small handful of people. And I I honestly, I believe... I don't know when it's going to come. I don't know how it's going to come. I'm believing and I'm praying that God's going God's to raise up enough pockets of people. Maybe we'll be part of it. I pray we'll be part of it. Enough pockets of people that we'll go, we thought we were going to lose a generation. But 
the story has to be rewritten because there was a group of people that decided now's the time to seek his face. I'm not going to lose. I'm not going to lose my sons and daughters. We're not going to lose our sons and daughters. Is, is that the price we're willing to pay to stay comfortable? Because that's what it is. We either go all in or we will lose a generation. I, I didn't even mean to talk about this, but it is what it is. I don't, I don't, I don't want to be the guy that's a part of church leadership that they go back and look and say, they just kept going about business as usual. They just, they saw what was coming, but they didn't care. What are we going to do? Like, I want us to be people that say, no. Now's the time. I'm going to break up my heart. I'm going to say I'm going to go after God because each one of us has a part to play. It may not be that you're up here preaching, but it may be that God uses you. Gosh, we have so much confusion among our young people. Our young men don't know how to be men. Our ladies don't know how to be ladies. All this gender neutral nonsense. We're so confused. Like, I'm not talking about like, you know, but there is a difference, okay? If, if, if you don't know there's a difference, then you're just blind. You are. Like, I, I have seen it. Like, with my little girls, it was like they were born speaking full sentences. Like, I know it's a little bit of an exaggeration, but Grace, right before she was two, she could carry on conversations with us. And then I come and I hang out with some of the little boys. And you know how they talk? Oh, Huh, you know, like, huh, poof, you know, <laughs> and you're telling me that God hasn't created them differently? They're different, man. Because we want to rebel against God. We're trying to push nor our own norms on them. And we need a generation to help come alongside them and go, yeah, buddy, it's okay for you to break things and blow stuff up because that's kind of how God wired you to be. And we're okay with cleaning it up. And we're okay with you climbing trees and breaking arms and being a boy because that, you know, like, it's all right. And girls, we're all right, you know, with you being ladies. Nothing wrong with that, you know? And there's nothing wrong with little girls that want to play sports and climb trees and do stuff, you know? Gosh. But man, we've got, we've got our work cut out for us, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to take more than me. It's going to take all of us saying, we've got to come alongside these that are coming up and pour into them. And you know what? I, I think what would happen is if we took our focus off of us <laughs> and we actually started doing what Jesus wants us to do, which is to live for others like he showed us and modeled, guess what? I think our problems would get a lot smaller. So many of us get so isolated in our stuff because we're so focused on ourselves. And I believe the Lord's inviting us to go, this thing is so much bigger than you. Look at who you can serve. Look at who you can love. And if you'll do this, he'll expand. He'll expand that little box that you're living in that's all about me and my world. And you will be blessed. And he'll start pouring into you as you start living for others. Now's the time. Now's the time to seek the Lord. I, I don't sleep. What else are we going to wait for? Like it, it kind of, like to me, this is like our Pearl Harbor moment. Like the United States wanted to just stay out of World War II. I'm going to end. I'm going to end right here, all right? United States wanted to stay out of World War II. They really did. They, didn't, they were like, you know, Europe, you figure that out. But then the battle came to them. You bomb Hawaii, guess what? Now we don't have a choice. But can you imagine if the United States had decided, you know, they bombed us. Let's just hope and pray they don't send anybody else. 
Because I feel like that's kind of what the church is doing. The devil's been bombing us. He's been bombing the generations for years. And we're just kind of crossing our fingers. Maybe he'll quit. Newsflash, he ain't going to quit. Now's the time. Now's the time. This is it. How, like, and this isn't a fear thing. Because having these little ones stand up here and just say, my fear doesn't stand a chance. We are going to raise up a generation. We are. We've got them right here. We are going to raise up a generation to know and seek the face of God. It's not going to happen on our watch. Amen? Amen. Amen. Colton, will you go to the piano, man? Would you just begin to pray? I'm not really sure exactly what the Lord wants to do yet. But can we just pray and see what he wants to do? Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, we need you. Jesus, we need you. Jesus, we need you. I'm just, I'm just going to ask, don't, don't keep it in your heart right now. You don't have to pray like super loud, but, but at least let words start coming out. Begin to pray. Like let's begin to pray together right now. Lord, we need you. Lord, we need you. Lord, we need you. Lord, there's a generation coming that needs you. Lord, we've watched for too long. We need you. Lord, we've, got, we've gotten too focused on ourselves. And we need you to lift our heads so that we can see that there's a harvest. Oh, we need you, Lord. We can't keep going the way we've been going. God, thank you that this church is perfectly positioned to see revival. Thank you that we're perfectly positioned to see a generation come to know you. Thank you that we have so many young ones in our congregation that we can pour into, that we can send into this generation to be the light. Thank you, God. Oh, God, break our hearts, Lord. If our hearts are not broken, Lord, break them now. We need a move. We need a move. We need a move, Lord. Like never before, we need a move. do what you want to do, Lord. We can't do it without you, God. We can't do it without you, God. We need you, Jesus. We don't want to lose our sons and daughters. God, we need something real. We need real fire burning on a real altar. kids to have encounters that cause them to doubt any bit of doubt that they would ever walk with Lord we want them to know you a real God Jesus we need you Jesus we need you God we say now is the time now is the time now is the time Lord Break off the hardness of heart. God, send an urgency in us. Send an urgency in us. you to come with the clarity that only your father's voice can bring lord 
Oh, we need you to come. We need you to come. Oh God, we need you. We can't fix what's coming, Lord. Only you can. Only you can. But Lord, we know you won't come where you're not invited. We need you, Lord. don't know that I've conveyed what's on the Father's heart because as I'm up here praying like here's what I know I know that there's part of me that my heart is broken at the prospect of what's coming if we don't see revival but just as I'm pacing and I'm praying up here like I feel like that's just a small taste of the brokenness that our Father is feeling it's not his will that any should perish he, he does not want a generation to be lost he doesn't want to generate the, the darkness the confusion the junk that they're struggling with like listen it is unreal and he doesn't want that he has so much better for us but we've got to shake ourselves out of the apathy and get in touch with his heart and sense that like his heart is broken over this like since I've heard Generation Z is the first post-Christian generation like I haven't been able to shake it this is my daughter's it means something to me I got skin in the game here And if that's how I feel for my three girls, let me tell you something, Generation Z is huge. There's millions of of young people that are part of Generation Z. Let me tell you something, there is a father in heaven that his heart is breaking to see a generation that will not know him, that will not know his ways, that will not know that he's kind, that will not know his love, that will not know the wholeness that he can give to them. He wants us to have some of that heart. He wants us to feel his heart this morning. Jesus. Jesus, help us. Okay, do it. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna bring the kids in and we're gonna pray over our kids just gather up as families. Caitlin, come up here. She's goofy as all get out, but she really does love Jesus a whole lot. And I think she's one that is a leader in her generation. Like, don't back down from that. Like she's one that God's going to use. he's going to use you but he's going to use you you're going to pray here in a second okay you can do that some of y'all would fire me if I got you up here to pray but she won't she can't Colton 
fired me. Jesus. Jesus. Say something. Um, oh, sure, the mic. Um, this week, I'm a teacher, if y'all don't know that, and I have been just living to get to fall break. Y'all teachers know what I'm talking about. Um, the busyness, the busyness that is a teacher's life and probably everybody else's life in general and has just been a heavy weight. I'm a student right now and I'm working full time and I have a lot of things going with my kids, but I read a quote this week that just really stood out to me and it's not from the Bible, but it said, um, if the devil can't make you bad, he'll just make you busy. Um, and I feel like that has kind of been what's happening um, in my life a lot. But I, as James was talking, I was just really praying into, um, Lord, make me discontent with the busyness, with the stuff that gets in the way that makes me feel heavy. Because I think that's a lot of what um, has been going on in the church, especially in America. And we're all busy. We're all trying to get to the top. We're all trying to, you know, do all the things with our kids or all the things with our family. And so that's going to be um, something that I'm going to be praying into with our church is that we would just be discontent with busyness, discontent with church as usual, um, discontent to come here um, and just do the same thing and then leave and not think about it again all week. Um, and so I'm just going to pray really quick. Is that all right? Um, Lord, we love you. We're so grateful that uh, you show up when we show up, God. You show up even when we don't show up. Um, I pray over this body of believers, Lord, and that you would stir in us today the seed that James has planted, that you inspired, God, and that we would not be content to do church as usual, Lord, but that we would be um, a light, Lord, for you in Shawnee, in our community, that there would be change coming, Lord, that we would get to um, reap a harvest of your righteousness and of your love, Lord, and that we would focus on our lives and, and where we're placing busyness where you should be. Lord, help us place you as the one thing, not everything else, and then make you a thing, Lord. Um, help to bring change in us. Help us to um, not be apathetic. Um, to care, Lord, and to not play religious games. Let's be real with each other, God. Let's show up and be vulnerable, to trust you enough to be vulnerable with each other, to be real, Lord. The generation that's coming up doesn't want religious games, but they want Jesus. They want authentic Jesus, Lord. And I just pray that our church would be a light to show that to people. We love you, Lord. Amen. Amen. We're going to pray two more times, all right? I'm going to have Caitlin pray, and then I'm going to pray, and we're going to pray together as families. But I'm going to have Caitlin, as a representative of Generation Z, I want you to pray for a move of God in your generation, and we're going to join you in praying for that, all right? Let's join with Caitlin. Here's a Generation Z, a Gen Zer. Gen Xer just sounds so much cooler, doesn't it? And I was kind of disappointed when I found out I wasn't part of Generation X because of millennials. Anyway, love them, but I'm one of them. But I want her to pray into Generation Z that we're going to see a move of God. Amen? Let's pray with her. Father, I just pray that... Um you would just have a hand over us, Lord, that you would be able to see this darkness that has been falling over our generation, Lord. And I just pray that uh, we wouldn't have to wear these masks anymore of this hidden pain, Lord, because we don't have a father that we know that can take that pain away, that can heal us like no other father. Father, I just pray that you would, there, there would be a change, that we would long for you, that we'd still have that desire in our heart, our fire in our hearts, Lord to just chase after you, to chase after your word and chase after the plan you have for us. Cause you only have a plan for good while we're digging into the bad. As everyone's throwing temptation at us, as bad just overcomes us, as we're just chasing after unwillful things, Lord. I pray that we turn to you for guidance. Lord, in our schools, in our lives, as young adults, as children, as teenagers, Lord, I pray we'd be able to turn to you to bow before your mighty name and to see the power that you have over us because your name is above all the other names, Lord. Yes. Depression, fear, anxiety that can't stand when we're standing in your love, Lord. 
Change us, Lord, for the better. Change the desires in our hearts. Thank you, Father. Thank you for what you're already doing in our lives, Lord. Thank you. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, y'all. Let's give praise to God that we believe that's going to happen. Now, if you have young ones, let's just gather with them, and I'm going to lead us just to pray over our kids. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Yeah, Lord. Thank you, Father, for each, each young person in this room, Lord. God, thank you that you have a plan and a purpose, a destiny for each one of these young people, Lord. God, I know that the enemy wants to abort destinies, but God, I thank you that you've raised us up to stand in the gap for them, Lord, that they may step fully into the plan and the purpose that you have for them. And we believe, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that a generation will not be lost. That, Lord, when they go back and they write about this period in history, that, Lord, it will confound the historians. It will confound the sociologists as they thought for sure that America was going to go the way of Europe and that we were going to lose uh, that Christian heartbeat, Lord. But, Father, you would, you would just allow there to be a remnant that remains, God. And that we would see a generation rise up and step into the fullness of your plan and purpose. Step into the fullness of the power that you've given to them. Lord, we thank you that there's not a junior Holy Spirit. And that you want to fill each one of these young people with you, the, the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord. To be used by you. To impact their families. To impact their schools. Lord, to be used by you in this church, God. Jesus, fill our young people with your power, with your spirit. Fill them with a vision for the life that you've called them to. God, do what only you can do in each one of these. Send revival to this generation, God. Send awakening to Generation Z, Lord. Thank you for what you're gonna do. We love you, Father. We believe that it will be done. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is good. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, in the words of Forrest Gump, that's about all I got to say about that. <clears throat> I love y'all very much. Um, I, I just pray that you would receive this. I bless you in the name of Jesus. That's a big deal. I bless you in the name of Jesus this morning. We'll have church tonight at six if you can make it back. Let's do it again. Let's come and worship the Lord. Let's seek his face together. Amen. God bless you. You can be dismissed this morning.